Hey, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm Casey Duckering, and this is Lecture 4A, um, the first of video for Module 2 of the course. So in the previous module, we learned about qubits, quantum gates, and circuits, the building blocks of quantum algorithms. Um, now in Module 2, we're going to start looking at the physical devices that run these quantum algorithms and how that informs the architecture of our algorithms and compilers. So in module two, we'll have four lectures, uh, each with um, two videos covering different aspects of uh, architecture and particularly from the perspective of compilers, which I'll, which I'll mention in a second. So in these lectures, we'll learn about transforming quantum programs from the high level circuit representation of a quantum program where you have basically how you describe the algorithm uh, and how you turn that down into a sequence of simple instructions you can actually run on a real quantum computer. Sequence of simple instructions. Um, and the limitations of quantum physics and the engineering of these devices to keep them simple will inform how we do this. So a compiler is a piece of software that um, does this transformation from algorithms to down to sim these simple instructions. Uh, and the exercises that'll go along with these lectures um, will have you implement or improve on um, various components of a quantum compiler that we'll describe in these lectures. So in lecture four, we'll break down uh, quantum algorithm into its basic pieces, uh, specifically one and two qubit gates on a specified fixed number of qubits. Uh, and in lecture five, we'll take that simplified circuit of um, one and two qubit gates and we'll optimize it so it uses either fewer gates, fewer qubits, runs faster, or some other metric like um, error or something like that. Um, and all while keeping the sequence of gates performing exactly the same computation. Um, and then later in lecture six and seven, we'll look at a little bit more of the uh, layout of qubits in a quantum computer and how this um, constrains what gates we can run and when we can run them and how, compile, how this affects the compilation and usually the compiler will do a lot of the work for us so we can write algorithms without these considerations and the compiler will add extra gates or schedule gates um, to make it fit whatever the limitations of the hardware you want to run it on are. So here's a big block diagram of the compilation flow um, we'll cover uh, many of the blocks in here over the next several lectures. So uh, in lecture four, we will um, cover um, decomposition and synthesis and also a bit of function cloning, loop unrolling, all these like under the umbrella of decomposition. Um, in five, when we do optimization, we will take the output of these decomposition steps um, and optimize it according to the characteristics and constraints that we have on the right over here. Uh, and then lecture six and seven, we'll talk about um, scheduling memory management and also the constraints of qubit connectivity um, and possibly some error. Oh. And also in lecture four, we'll talk about control flow um, and how that relates to decomposition. And sprinkled in there, we'll talk about how the input algorithm relates to these and how the output, um, how the output that can actually run on your quantum processor with a classical control hardware actually informs all the decisions in here. Okay, so let's get into it. So today I'll introduce um, classical compilers for those who haven't taken the compilers class. Um, and I'll compare the simulators and different differences between 
different types of compilers, in particular logic synthesis, um, and how that relates to quantum. Um, and then we'll get into uh, a major step in the compiler where we decompose these algorithms down into the basic gates I was talking about. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about uh, control flow, um, various types um, where you control where you have a classical condition or quantum conditions and loops um, in your quantum algorithm and how these get decomposed and how they're implemented in hardware. Um, and then the next video, um, we'll continue with this and look closer into the requirements um, of reversible computing um, and the no cloning theorem as uh, required by quantum physics um, that are different from if we were to compile a classical program. These give us extra constraints on how we can uh, copy data and move data around. Okay, so let's give a quick overview of compilers. So what is a compiler? Um, so you've probably seen a compiler before in your intro programming classes. Um, so like GCC and Clang are some examples if you've ever written C or C++. Um, other common examples are like your web browser for any JavaScript that you, when you browse the web. Um, also, C Python, even though Python's interpreted, um, it actually has a compiler in there to make it run faster as well. And there's many other examples. Um, basically, anything you run on your computer is compiled. Um, so, what a compiler does, or the purpose of a compiler, is to translate um, some source code that a human can read and understand, which has a bunch of high level concepts that um, are useful for talking about um, programs and translate it into simple machine readable instructions that um, the hardware of your computer understands and can execute quickly. So some examples of um, <clears throat> high level of high level abstractions are like loops, functions, variables, objects, data structures, um, basically anything that you interact with in a programming language. And what the CPU in your computer understands is it can read and write values from your memory or your RAM. It can do some basic addition, multiplication, arithmetic, and it can um, do very simple like if statements or conditional branches, where if this value is a one, then go to this different instruction. And so the job of the compiler is to translate all these high level concepts um, that you specify in a program down to very simple instructions that um, have the same effect of those high level um, abstractions. So that's a quick whirlwind of what compilers do. Now I'm going to talk about um, a bit more specialized type of compiler um, that we refer to as logic synthesis, where uh, instead of taking a piece of software that we run um, on a CPU on your regular computer, this is taking a description a, a program that um, is intended to be implemented as logic gates, um, typically on FPGA or as an integrated circuit um, out of transistors. So the difference here is that instead of um, instructions that run the CPU, like additions, branches, or so on, you have these logic gates with inputs and outputs like a NOT gate, AND gate, which you've likely seen before. And the program describes how to hook these up into larger circuits that perform computations. So this is a different model of computation than the sequential instruction by instruction um, of CPUs. And instead we have gates and input wires, intermediate wires, and output wires. 
there's an AND gate and an OR gate. And so based on the inputs and the way you hook these up, you get a certain output value. And instead of getting an executable file like on your computer that you can run, you actually get a design file with um, transistors on it that actually describe, um, for example, a chip that you can fabricate. And now this is the result of your compiled program. And if you power this with, volt with some voltage, it will actually, each of these um, pins here is an input or an output. Um, and it actually runs whatever program you compiled and fabricated on this chip. So now let's go to um, quantum compilers and quantum programs. So they have some similarities to both regular compilers and logic synthesis. Um, so they use gates and what will draw as wires, but are actually qubits. Um, but the instructions aren't actually um, physical devices like transistors. They're instructions um, like on like for regular compilers. So the equivalent logic gates here are here's the not and the AND gate like I showed before the quantum versions, and also the XOR gate. So you still have the inputs on the left, outputs on the right, with the gate in the middle. Um, but in this case, you always have the same number of input and output gates, um, which I'll get into in the next lecture why that is. And just like before, you can piece these gates together. So this is three Toffoli gates. Um, so the Toffoli gate here has is implements an AND, which you've seen. So just to remind you, these two control qubits, if they're both a one, then it will flip this target. So if the target starts at zero, then the target will be a one if the two controls were ones. And it can run to position because these are qubits. All right, so you can put these uh, multiple gates together into a larger circuit and we stretch and we stretch them here um, to show that this um, Toffler gate has inputs C1, C2, and this is zero. Um, so now this doesn't get implemented as transistors. Um, it gets uh, compiled to this assembly code on the right, which is just a sequence of gates to execute on the hardware. And what that looks like um, is here we have a 22 qubit chip where each of these crosses here is a qubit. And on the side are some circuitry um, to control the signals that, mod that manipulate the qubit in the middle here. Uh, I've highlighted these two qubits on the right. So when we implement gates, so here's our circuit on the top. We have a Hadamard gate on qubit one and a CNOT gate between qubit one, qubit zero, and then two measurement gates. So to actually run this on hardware, the Hadamard gets turned into this um, pulse. So what this pulse is, is an analog um, signal with this amplitude gets sent along, gets generated by some analog um, electronics next to the quantum computer, um, sent along a wire into this chip, um, filtered by some of this elect electronics here and causes this qubit to have a Hadamard rotation. Um, and then the CNOT is actually implemented by several smaller gates. This is a single qubit gate on qubit zero. This is a single qubit gate on qubit one. Um, this is a two qubit cross resonance gate on the two of them. And this is a two qubit, a single qubit again, and then a two qubit again. And that's those sequence of pulses sent along each of these wires um, causes a C naught to occur between these two qubits. And then at the end, we have a special 
uh, measurement pulse that causes uh, the qubit to emit a signal that we can then read out from outside and determine if the qubit was in a zero or the one state. So I'm not going to talk about pulses um, for now, but this base, but this basic way that they get run on the hardware will inform the higher levels when we talk about gates. And I'll only talk about CNOT gates mostly, but understand that under the hood, it actually gets run as the sequence of pulses. So now let's talk about program decomposition. So program decomposition is basically just uh, you have a high level program like a main function um, calling sub functions that call other functions and you're trying to just flatten that into a long sequence of basic instructions or gates. Um, so just as an example of what that means, um, I'll show a circuit that adds two numbers, um, a quantum circuit. So here, here's a circuit. Uh, we have um, input carry bit. We have register A and register B, um, each with six qubits here, and then an output um, carry out bit. And then at the end of the circuit, the register B is replaced with register S representing the sum of A and B. So there's many ways to implement this. Um, this is a um, Kikaro adder. Uh, and the way it's described in the 2004 paper is you do these majority operations, which I'll describe in a second um, in this sequence, and then these unmajority and add operations in this sequence and that adds two numbers. So to actually implement this, we need to know what each of these sub circuits does. So they helpfully describe what they do here. Um, so majority is, can be implemented with this sequence of gates, C naughts and Toffelis, and unmajority and add can be either this or this. And then decomposition is simply substitute each of these Subcircuit calls with the actual circuit. So just, and we get that. And then we can move the individual gates horizontally and without adjusting what the circuit does. So we can compress it a little bit. And of course, um, these Toffoli gates can't be implemented directly. So you have to break them down into smaller gates again. So each of these gets replaced with this sequence of 60 knots and single qubit gates. All right, so here's another example, um, full stack of Shor's algorithm, which is al the algorithm to uh, factor a number into its prime factors. So this is a high level description of it um, as a diagram. Um, do these Hadamard gates and these controlled um, modular exponentiation circuits, followed by an inverse quantum Fourier transform, um, which tells you the period and gives you the answer. So I won't go into the details of this, but what the compiler sees is you specify this high level thing, and then you also have a function that specifies, for example, the QFT is implemented by this sequence of controlled rotation gates, each of which can be substituted with a sequence of two or three CNOTs, giving you a circuit of just CNOTs. And each of these um, modular exponentiation circuits can be implemented as a sequence of modular multiplications like this, with each of these modular multiplications can be, and so on, can, done by these adders, and these adders can be implemented by these regular adders, which I described before. And if you substitute each of these iteratively into the parent, you end up with um, a very, very large circuit of just C knots um, that, that implements Shor's algorithm. That's um, decomposition. 
it's pretty simple, but the end result, which is our goal, is to get a very simple flat circuit of two qubit and one qubit gates that we can run directly on hardware. So now, so far, I haven't talked about um, control flow. All of these have been just a single sequence of gates with no, basically no if statements or loops. You just run it on the quantum computer, you measure the result, and you get your answer. So sometimes we need um, control flow. So there's multiple types of control flow when we're talking about quantum algorithms. So we can talk about classical control flow, where we have classical data that's determining whether we perform quantum gates or not. So um, that's basically if statements or loops. Um, so here's how we draw it diagrammically. Um, so these double lines represent classical bits and these single lines represent um, quantum bits like normal. So we can draw it here as if the condition is one or true, then we perform this true subcircuit. And if it's false, we perform this false subcircuit. And I've substituted in some random gates here um, just to show what happens. So when you decompose these subcircuits into their individual gates, you get, um, you have to spread the control to each of the gates. So um, this control block becomes like an X if the condition is one, and then a T if the condition is one, and then a C naught if the condition is one. And if the condition is zero, it'll do just a single um, T gate here. So this is great, but the um, quantum computer control hardware that sends those pulses that we talked about would have to check this condition to determine whether to send the pulse at that step or not. So that requires a bit of extra complexity at the control hardware level of checking each condition when it performs a gate, um, which isn't supported by current hardware, but may in the near future. So a simpler way of doing it is to just um, compile two different versions of the program. So if we know this condition at before we need to run the circuit, we can actually check the condition and then compile two different circuits depending on the condition. So if the condition is true, we'll substitute in the true block and compile the whole circuit and run it. If it's false, we'll substitute in the false block, compile the circuit and run it. And we can do this if we have multiple conditions in our circuit, we can do this all at once and then compile the resulting circuit and run it. Um, and loops can work the same way where we at compile time determine how many times the loop repeats, copy the block that many times, and then um, compile the circuit with that with those copies in it. Okay. So there's another type of control flow um, where the condition is a quantum bit. So since it's quantum, the control can be in a superposition of zero and one or true and false. So both the true and the false blocks both execute in superposition. So in the half where the control bits are one, the true gates execute. And in the case where it's a zero, the false blocks, the false gates are execute. And we can expand this uh, decompose it the same way um, where the control gets copied to each of the gates. But instead of this being classical control where you, the X gate gets executed or not executed, this becomes uh, a new gate with, the, with a control. So now this X becomes a C naught, the T becomes a controlled T gate, which can be decomposed into um, two or three C naughts. And a C naught gate turns into a Toffoli gate, um, which of course we can decompose into six C naught gates again. Um, and this, this all goes straightforwardly if for larger circuits as well. And if you have nested conditions, you just have 
more and more controls added to these gates. Um, quantum loops aren't don't really work, um, but basically, if you have a loop, you unroll it and each to as many copies as the maximum number of times a loop can run, and then each um, iteration of the loop has a different control that basically says whether the loop went that many times or not. Um, and the way we defined Shor's algorithm with the way Shor's algorithm was defined earlier with um, those repetitions of gates on different controls can be implemented as a loop that gets unrolled, basically. Um, and the final type of um, control flow is basically an outer loop for the quantum circuit. So this is actually very common in um, near-term algorithms like um, QA and VQE, where you have a classical um, search algorithm you want to run, but there's a component of it that um, would be faster to run on a quantum computer than a classical computer. So you have a small quantum, quantum circuit with some parameters, um, or maybe you change some gates in it each time. And every iteration of the classical algorithm tweaks this circuit, recompiles and runs it, and makes some measurements. And then um, the classical program will um, do some calculations, decide on a new circuit to run, and run it. Um, so those are the three types of control flow. Um, and how they relate to compilers and program decomposition. So in summary, um, so we talked about compilers compared to classical compilers, um, logic synthesis, and how they relate to um, quantum compiling. Um, but boils down to you have an algorithm written in a programming language and you um, break it down and simplify it into these basic quantum gates that you can run, give a sequence and run directly on hardware. And so we talked about decomposition, a major step of this, where we break down each of the sub modules, i.e. functions, um, from the top level of your algorithm down to the lowest, simplest functions. And then we also talked about um, different types of control flow where we have classical bits in the al algorithm controlling which quantum gates are run and we have um, quantum bits that control which gates are run, which we have to run both the true and the false paths under superposition um, to make sure that it happens correctly. Um, so thanks for listening. Um, next week we'll talk about um, some similar things with decomposition, but specifically for how it relates to reversible computing and the restrictions that has.